Hi everybody, welcome back to our coverage of the Cloud Native Security Con. I'm Dave Vellante here in our Boston studio. We're connecting today with Palo Alto, with John Furrier and Lisa Martin. We're also live from the show floor in Seattle. But right now I'm here with Andy Tarai, who from Constellation Research, a friend of theCUBE. And we're going to discuss the intersection of AI and security, the potential of AI, the risks, and the future. Andy, welcome, good to see you again. Good to be here again. Hey, so let's get into it. Can you talk a little bit about, I know this is a, a, a passion of yours, the ethical considerations surrounding a AI. I mean, it's, it's front and center in the news and you know, you've got accountability, privacy, security, biases. Should we be worried about AI from a security perspective? Absolutely, man, <laughs> you should be worried. See, the problem is people don't realize this, right? I mean, the chat GPT being a new shiny object, it's all the craze that's about. But the problem is most of the content that's produced either by ChatGPT or even by others, it's on asses, no warranties, no accountability, no whatsoever. Particularly if it is content, it's okay. But if it is something like a code that you use, for example, you know, one of their side projects, the GitHub's co-pilot, which is actually OpenAI plus Microsoft plus you know, GitHub's combo, they allow you to produce code. AI writes code basically, right? But when you write code, problem with that is, it's not exactly stolen, but the models are created by using the GitHub code. Actually, they're getting sued for that, saying that you know you can't use our code. Actually, there's a guy, Tim Davidson, I think his name, a professor. He actually demonstrated how AI produced exact copy of the code that he has written. So it's right now, it's a lot of security, accountability, privacy issues. You know, use it either to train or to learn, but in my view, it's not ready for enterprise grade yet. So Brian Bellendorf today in his keynote said he's really worried about chat GPT being used yep. to automate spear phishing. Oh. So uh, I'm like, okay, so let's unpack that a little bit. Is the concern there that it just, the chat GPT writes such compelling phishing content that people are going to be, it's going to increase the probability of somebody clicking on it or are there other dimensions? It, it could. It, it's not necessarily just chat GPT for that matter, right? AI can, actually the, the, the hackers are using it to an extent already, can use to individualize content. For example, you know, one of the things that you are ably, able to easily identify when you're looking at the, the emails that are coming in, the phishing attack is, you look at some of the key elements in it, whether it's a human or even you know if it's an automated AI-based system. So they look at certain things and they say, okay, this is phishing. But if, if, if you are to read an email, that looks exact copy of what I would have sent to you saying that, hey, Dave, are you on for tomorrow? Or click on this link to do whatever. Right. It could individualize the message. That's where the volume at scale to individual to masses, that can be done using AI, which is what scares me. Is there a flip side to AI? How is it being utilized to help cybersecurity? And, and maybe you could talk about some of the more successful examples of AI and security, like, you know, are there use cases or are there companies out there, Andy, that you find, I know you're close to a lot of firms that are, that are sort of leading in this area. You know, you and I have talked about CrowdStrike, I know Palo Alto Network. So is there a, a, a positive side to this story? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Um, those are some of the good companies you mentioned. CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, Doctrace is another one that I closely follow, which is a good company as well, that they're using AI for security purposes. So here's the thing, right? When people say, when they're using malware detection systems, most of the malware detection systems that, that are in today, security and malware systems, use some sort of a signature and pattern scanning in the malware. You know how many identified malwares are there today in their repository, in the library? more than a billion, a billion. So if you are to check for every malware in your repository, that's not going to work. The, the pattern-based recognition is not going to work. So you got to figure out a different way of identification of pattern of usage, not just a signature in a malware, right? Or, you know, there, there are other areas you could use, things like, you know, when, when um, the usage patterns, for example, you know, if Andy is coming in to work at a certain time, you could combine a facial recognition saying that should he be in here at that time? And should he be doing things what he's supposed to be doing? There are a lot of things you could do using that, right? And, and the AI ops use cases, which is one of my favorite areas that I work, do a lot of work, right? That, that has use cases for you know, detecting things that are anomaly, that are, that are not supposed to be done in a way they're supposed to be, you know, the, the, uh, reducing the noise so you can escalate only the things what you're supposed to. So AOPS is a great use case to use in the security areas, which they're not using it uh, to an extent yet. Incident management is another area. 
So yeah. in your malware example, you're saying, okay, known malware, and pretty much anybody can deal with that yeah. now. That's sort of yesterday's the unknown problem. Unknown it's, is the, the problem. It's the unknown malware, really trying to understand the patterns, and the patterns are going to going to change. It's not like you're saying a common signature because they're going to use AI to change things up at scale. So it's here's the problem, right? The malware writers are also using AI now, right? So they are not going to write the old malware send it to you. They are actually creating malware on the fly. It is possible entirely in today's world that they can create a malware, drop in your systems, and it'll it look for the. Uh, uh, let me get the name right. It's called. Uh, what do we What do we use it here? Uh, it's called the the TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Yeah. It look for that to figure out. You know, okay, am I doing the right pattern? And then malware can sense that, saying that, okay, if that's the one they are detecting, I'm going to change it on the fly. So AI can code itself on the fly, or rather malware can code itself on the fly, which is going to be hard to detect. Well, and when you talk, you talk about uh, TTP, when you talk to folks like Kevin Mandy of Mandy, and to, recently purchased by Google, or, mm -hmm. or, or other of those, you know, the ones that have the big observation space, they'll, they'll talk about the, the most malicious hacks that they see involve lateral movement. So that's obviously something that people are looking for, AI's looking for that, and of course the hackers are going to try to mask that later, lateral <laughs> movement, living off the land and you know other things. How do you see AI impacting the, the future of, of cyber? We talked about the, the risks and the, and the good. You know, one of the things that, that uh, Brian Bellendorf also mentioned is that, you know, he pointed out that in the early days of the internet, the protocols had a, an, an, an inherent element of trust involved. So things like you know, SMTP, they, they, they didn't have you know, security built in. Uh, so they built up a lot of technical debt. You know, do you see AI being able to help with that? What steps do you see being taken to ensure that, that AI-based systems are secure? So the, the major difference between the older systems and the newer systems is the older systems Sadly, even to date, a lot of them are rules-based. If it's a rules-based system, you're dead in the water on arrival, right? So, so the AI-based systems can somewhat learn from the patterns as I was talking about. You know, for example, anomaly. so when you say rules-based systems, you mean here's the policy, here's the rule. If it's not followed, boom! But then you're saying yeah. AI will blow that away. AI will blow that away. You don't have to necessarily codify things saying that okay, if if this, then do this. You don't have to necessarily do that. AI can somewhat to an extent learn, self-learn, saying that, okay, if that doesn't happen, if this is not a pattern that I know which is supposed to happen, who should I escalate this to? Who does this system belong to? And the other thing, the AIOps use case we talked about, right? The anomalies. When an anomaly happens, then the system can closely look at saying that, okay, this is not a normal behavior or usage. Is that because system being overused, or is it because somebody's trying to access something, you know? It could look at the anomaly detection, anomaly, you know, prevention, or even prediction to an extent. And that's where AI could be very useful. So, how about the developer angle? Because CNCF, the, the event in Seattle is all around, you know, developers. How can AI be, be integrated? We did a lot of talk at the conference about shift left. We talk about shift left and protect right, meaning, you know, protect the runtime. So both are, both are important. Um, but so what steps should be taken to ensure that, that the AI systems are being developed in a secure and ethically sound way? What's the role of developers in that regard? How long you got? Yeah. <laughs> you could go for days on that. So <laughs> here's the problem, problem, right? A lot of these companies are trying to see, I mean, you might have seen that in the news, that BuzzFeed is trying to hire all of the writers to create the thing that GPT is creating. A lot of enterprises- You say they're going to fire their writers. Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they replace the writers. It's like with automated, automated vehicles automated and, and, and Uber yeah. drivers. So, yeah. so the problem is a lot of enterprises still haven't done that, at least the ones I'm speaking to, are thinking about saying, hey, you know what? Can I replace my developers because they are so expensive? Can I replace them with AI-generated code? There are a few issues with that. One, AI-generated code is based on some sort of a snippet of a code that has been already available. So you get into copyright issues. That's issue number one, right? Issue number two, if AI creates code, and if something were to go wrong, who's responsible for that? There's no accountability right now. Are you, as, the, as, a, as a company that's creating a system, is responsible, or is it ChatGPT, Microsoft is responsible? Or the developer. Who's liable? Or the, or the, the, the individual developer yeah. might be. So 
they're going to be cautious about there's, there's that so, liability. Well, so one of the areas where I'm seeing a lot of enterprises using this is they are using it to teach developers to learn things. You know what, if you are to code, this is a good way to code. That area it's okay because you're just teaching them. But if you are to put in an actual production code, this is what I, I advise companies. Look, if somebody is using even to create a code, whether with or without your permission, make sure that once the code is committed, you validate that 100%. Whether it's a code or a model, or even make sure that the data what you're feeding in is, is completely out of bias or no bias, right? Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who, what, when did that. If you put out a service or a system out there, it, it is involving your company liability and system and code in place, you're going to be screwed regardless of what. If something were to go wrong, you are the first person who's liable for it. Andy, when you think about the dangers of, of, of AI, you know, and kind of what keeps you up at night if you're you know, a security professional, AI and security professional. Uh, we talked about chat GPT, you, you know, doing things. We don't even, you know, look, the, the hackers are going to get, get, get creative. But what worries you the most when you think about this topic? <laughs> a lot, a lot, right? Um, it, let's start off with, the, with an example. Actually, I don't know if you had a chance to see that or not. Um, the hackers used, um, um, Bank of Hong Kong uh, used a, a defect mechanism to fool Bank of Hong Kong to transfer $35 million to a fake account. The money yes. is gone, right? right? Mm -hmm. And the problem that is what they did was they interacted with the, with the manager and they learned this executive who can control a big account and, and cloned his voice and cloned his patterns on how he calls and what he talks and the whole name he has. After learning that, they called the branch manager or bank manager and say, hey, you know what? Hey, move this much money to whatever, right? So that's one way of kind of phishing, kind of deep fake, you know, that can come. Imagine, so that's just one example. Imagine whether business is conducted by just using voice or phone calls itself. That's an area of concern if you are to do that. And imagine this became an uproar a few years back when DeepMind Deepfakes put out the video of Tom Cruise and others we talked about in the past, right? And Tom Cruise looked at the video, he said that he couldn't distinguish that he didn't do it. It is so close, that close, right? And and they are doing things like, you know, they're using Jim Sills. It's an jokes. awesome Instagram account, by the way. The, guy, the guy's <laughs> hilarious, right? So <laughs> they're they using a lot of those fake videos and fake stuff. As long as it's only for entertainment purposes, good. But imagine yeah, doing the- Yeah, nobody gets hurt there, yeah, but- But during the election season, when people were to put out saying that, okay, this current president or ex-president, he said what? And the masses believe right now whatever they see in TV. That's an unfortunate thing. I mean, there's no fact-checking involved, and you know, you could you could change governments and elections using that, which is which is scary shit. Well, you right? think about 2016. You know, that was when we really first saw you know the weaponization of social, yep. the heavy use of social, and then 2020 was like, wow, it to was the next crazy, level, crazy. Yeah. You know, the polarization. Yeah. 2024 with deep could be the next level. Yeah. They're going to be. I mean, it's just going to it's just going to escalate. Um, what about public policy? I want to pick your brain on this because. I've seen situations where the EU, for example, is going to restrict the ability to ship certain code if it's involved with, with critical infrastructure. So let's say, uh, you know, example, you're running a nuclear facility and you've got you're the f you've got the code that protects that facility, and 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 it it can be useful against some other malware that's outside of that country, but you're restricted from sending that for whatever reason, data sovereignty. Is public policy is it aligned with the objectives in this new world or, or I mean, normally they have to catch up. Is that going to be a problem in your view? It is because, you know, uh, the, when it comes to laws, it's always miles behind when a new innovation happens. It's not just for AI, right? I mean, the same thing happened with IoT, same thing happened with, you know, whatever else new emerging tech you have. The laws have to understand if there's an issue and they have to see a continued pattern of misuse of the technology, then they'll come up with that. EU is, in, in, in a ways, they are ahead of things, so they put a lot of restrictions in place about what AI can or cannot do. U.S. is way behind on that, right? But California has done some things. For example, you know, if if you're talking to a chat, um, you know, chat bot, then you have to basically disclose that to the customer, saying that you're talking to a chat bot, not to a human. And that's just a very basic rule that they have in place. Uh, you know, I mean, there are times that when a decision is made by the the problem is AI is a black box now. The decision making is also a black box now. 
and we don't tell people. And the problem is if you tell people, you'll get sued immediately because every single time, we talked about that last time, there are cases involving AI making decisions that gets thrown out the window all the time if you can't substantiate that. So the bottom line is that, yes, AI can assist and help you in making decisions, but just use that as an assistant mechanism. A human has to be always in all the loop, right? Will AI help with, in your view, with supply chain, the software supply chain mm -hmm. security, or, or, or is it, you know, it's always a balance, right? I mean, I feel like the attackers are more advanced in some, some ways. It's like they're on offense, let's say, right? So when, you, when you're calling the plays, you know where you're going, the defense has to respond to it. So in that sense, the hackers have an advantage. So is, what's the balance with supply, software supply chain? Are the hackers have the advantage because they can use AI to, to accelerate their penetration of the software supply chain? Or will AI, in your view, be a good defensive mechanism? It could be, but the problem is the velocity and veracity of you know things can be done using AI in in you know in in whether it's phishing or malware or other security and you know, vulnerability scanning the whole nine yards. It's scary because the hackers have a full advantage right now. And actually, I think it's ChatGPT recently put out uh, two things. One is it's able to detect the code if it is generated by ChatGPT. So basically, if you're trying to fake, because a lot of schools were complaining about it, that's why they came up with the mechanism. So if you're trying to create a fake, there's a mechanism for them to identify. But that's a step behind still, right? And, and the hackers are using things to, to their advantage. Actually, Chad GPT made a rule. If you go there and read the terms and conditions, it's basically a honor rule suggesting you can use this for certain purposes to create a malware, create a security threat, as if people are going to listen. So, if there's a way or mechanism to restrict hackers from using these technologies, that would be great, but I don't see that happening. So know that these guys have an advantage, know that they are using AI, and you have to do things to be prepared. One other thing I was mentioning about is, you know, if somebody writes a code, if somebody commits a code, right now, the problem is with the agile methodologies, if somebody writes a code, if they commit a code, you assume that's right and legit, you immediately push it out into production because need for speed is there, right? But if you continue to do that with the AI produced code, yes, screw it. So bottom line, is, is AI gonna, gonna speed us up in a security context or is it gonna slow us down? Well, <clears throat> in the current version, the AI systems are flawed because even the chat GPT, if you look at that, the large, large language models, you look at the corpus of data that's available in the world as of today, and then it trained them using that model, using the data, right? But people are forgetting that's based on today's data. The data changes on a second basis or on a minute basis. So if I want to do something based on tomorrow's or day after, you have to retrain the models. So the data, what do you have is stale. So that in itself is stale, and the cost for retraining is going to be a problem too. So overall, AI is a good first, first step. Use that you know, with a caution, is what I want to say. The system is flawed now. If you use it as is, you'll be screwed. It's dangerous. Andy, you got to go. Thanks so much for coming in. Appreciate it. And thank Thanks for you. having me. You're very welcome. So we're, we're going wall to wall with our coverage of the Cloud Native Security Con. I'm Dave Vellante in the Boston studio, John Furrier, Lisa Martin in Palo Alto. We're going to be live on the show floor as well, bringing in keynote speakers and others on the ground. Keep it right there for more coverage on theCUBE.